Uh, we have some uh, uh, 200 plus uh, attendees. Uh, the main agenda of today's webinar is to highlight the importance of uh, correct storage and segregation on board ships, uh, strictly controlled dangerous goods planning process. Uh, everything comes from the accuracy of shippers declaration, how it has to be done. Discipline cutoff times, uh, not to push the dangerous goods at the last moment. Uh, of course, uh, the most important topic is uh, training and uh, access to IMDG code. In the recent past, uh, especially in the last uh, two, three years, there have been uh, many uh, accidents, including uh, loss of lives on board ships, uh, also loss of total loss of vessels, uh, which are apparently originated from undeclared, misdeclared dangerous goods. Also certain dangerous goods, uh, which uh, historically has been classified in the regulations with certain special provisions which can exempt uh, from certain classification of a particular class, uh, all those type of issues. But most of the issues are because of misdeclared or undeclared dangerous goods, uh, which ends up in fire, explosion, loss of lives and loss of property and huge damage to the environment. When we uh, look at misdeclared and danger, uh, undeclared dangerous goods, misdeclared means any dangerous goods which is listed in IMDG code or meeting the criteria of IMDG code is wrongly declared, either wrong UN number, wrong packing group, wrong technical name, uh, wrong or you know incorrect marking, labeling, placarding of the containers, etc. are misdeclared. Undeclared dangerous goods are those dangerous goods which are offered as normal cargo but actually it is listed in IMDG code by name or it meets one or more classes criteria, classification criteria of IMDG code and the shipper has offered it as uh, non hazardous general cargo that is undeclared dangerous goods. Uh, this year somewhere in the May, June, uh, we did a global survey on uh, reason for misdeclaration and non-declaration of uh, dangerous goods. And uh, surprisingly, most of the respondents, that is 67% respondents uh, said uh, the reason for misdeclaration or non-declaration is mostly because of the ignorance of the provisions of IMDG code. And uh, a 30 plus percentage of the respondents uh, from the industry who has the knowledge of the working procedures of all the parties said it is willful default from the shipper or uh, whoever are the uh, consigners. Now, there can be various reasons for um, ignorance of the provisions as well as various reasons for uh, willful default in misdeclaration of the cargo. But whether it is misdeclared or undeclared, both can cause havoc, havoc on board ships, even loss of lives. Uh, this survey is still open. Post this session, I'll be sharing the link for the survey. I would uh, be very happy with your expertise and knowledge. You can contribute suggestions for reducing or, you know, uh, targeting to eliminate this type of menace to the industry and safety. We all know that uh, there are nine classes of dangerous goods. Uh, some of the classes are divided into divisions. Uh, we'll not be in this session. We'll not be going into the you know each class wise hazards or anything. This uh, numerical order of the classes does not have any uh, what you call precedence of hazard. Uh, it it all depends upon you know which class of hazardous cargo. Uh, meets in an uh, you know uh, incident or accident, but among all the classes of class one to class nine, the most dangerous is always class two point three toxic gases because the moment the poisonous gases escape from the containment that is a cylinder or a tank, it can cause uh, loss of life. All other classes other than two point three, there is no order of priority or precedence in uh, hazard. There are various kinds of uh, risk involved in transportation of dangerous goods. Uh, some of which are listed here, uh, like explosion, acid burns, death, toxicity, ex uh, you know, exposure to the uh, toxic chemicals, oxidizing chemicals, starting a fire, etc. Uh, direct risk is, of course, to the life, uh, health, and life of the people on board ships and in the transport chain. Uh, also, environment, vessel, other transport vehicles, and other cargoes. Indirect risk is planes and bad publicity. But we cannot stop transportation of dangerous goods because dangerous goods and other non-dangerous chemicals are very vital for our economy and the progress of our world. 
As we all know, IMDG code is a mandatory regulation for transportation of uh, dangerous goods in package form by sea. Not only dangerous goods, dangerous goods as well as marine pollutants in package form by sea. IMDG code became mandatory from 1st January 2004. Objective of IMDG code is to enhance safety of life at sea, protection of marine environment, also to facilitate unrestricted movement of the cargo throughout the globe by sea. As we are talking about the storage and uh, segregation on board ships, uh, those who have uh, been on board ship, worked on board ship, I can see many master mariners, mates, second mates, etc. attending this session. Uh, they all know very well what is uh, on deck and under deck. Uh, those who do not know that terms very familiar. You can uh, roughly consider like uh, when you look at a container ship, whichever containers you can see by your eyes, uh, all those containers are on deck. Whichever containers you don't see, which is in the cargo hold, they are under deck. So IMDG code uh, assigns storage categories for each UN number that is uh, specific to a UN number, uh, whether it can be loaded on deck or under deck. Uh, there is a definition what is uh, weather deck. On deck means storage on the weather deck. Weather deck is at least from top and two sides of the cargo is exposed to the weather. For the purpose of uh, storage on board ships, IMDG code divides uh, ships into two categories, that is cargo ships and passenger ships. If you look at air uh, dangerous goods, it is the same thing, uh, passenger aircraft and cargo aircraft or cargo aircraft only. Same way IMDG code divides the uh, ships into cargo ships and passenger ships for carriage of uh, dangerous goods in package form. Uh, again, uh, in the cargo ships and passenger ships, there is a limitation of number of passengers, etc. And uh, for storage categories, for the decision whether a particular UN number belonging to a particular class or packing group, whether it can be loaded under deck or it must be loaded on deck only, that is assigned or allocated storage categories in uh, column 16A of dangerous goods list. Class 1 explosive storage categories are 0, 1 to 0, 5. Class 2 to 9 storage categories are A, B, C, D, and or. E, that is uh, alphabetical storage categories. Let's just look at the storage categories of class 1 explosives. Class 1 explosives, again the ships are divided into two types, cargo ships up to 12 passengers and passenger, other passenger ships, again on deck or under deck in cargo close cargo transport unit or not. Uh, depending, uh, passenger ships are, uh, you know, uh, requires more uh, risk analysis because passengers are the Passengers means uh, who are not on the crew list uh, become passenger and uh, then in that case the passenger ship uh, it is not only on deck and under deck uh, it may require pro uh, prohibition of certain types of explosives also limitation on net explosive content type of cargo transport unit on deck under deck etc. When we look at uh, other than explosives uh, Okay, before going to the explosives, uh, explosives are class 1.1, division 1.1 to 1.6. Uh, so when we mix load different explosives in the same container, uh, the presence of uh, hazard uh, must be taken into consideration. Uh, it is in the order of 1.1, 1 1.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.6 and 0.4. So if you mix load these explosives in the same container, if it is permitted as according to the segregation, the most stringent division must be considered for the storage and segregation on board ship. Uh, it also applies for the explosives containers placarding. Explosives have different rules, uh, slightly different rules than the other classes. When we look at class 2 to 9, again ships are divided into cargo ships and passenger ships. Cargo ships are limited to maximum 25 passengers or one passenger for 3 meters of overall length of the ship. Uh, again, storage categories are uh, assigned A, B, C, D and uh, or E, uh, where cargo uh, passenger ships, uh, it is mostly on deck only or it is prohibited. Cargo ships, it is on deck, under deck or it is on deck only. Cargo ships accepts almost everything other than what is prohibited by IMDG code in special portion 900 and other 300 series special portions. Now, any UN number. Uh, I would like to reiterate uh, in between uh, while we are going through this presentation, uh, all the decisions of accepting a cargo by the Shipping Lines Dangerous Goods Department 
Uh, once it is accepted, the storage planner's uh, job of planning the container on deck or under deck or away from the accommodation, whatever, it all depends upon the accuracy of the shipper's declaration. Uh, that accuracy of the shipper's declaration depends upon the correctness of the classification of dangerous goods, assignment of UN number and packing group, etc. Packing group uh, indicates the uh, level of danger. Uh, some of the hazard classes and UN numbers are assigned with packing group 1, 2 or uh, 3. Uh, that is uh, high hazard, medium hazard and low hazard. A uh, packing group, difference in packing group for the same UN number may change the storage categories. Uh, I have listed down uh, two examples of UN 1479 and 1993. 1479 class 5.1 packing group 1, cargo ship cities on deck only, passenger ship cities prohibited. Packing group 2 and 3, it is on deck or under deck for cargo ships. So here again, the accuracy of the information provided by the shipper takes a vital role. Uh, these days, most of the most of us work on stock softwares and uh, other digital tools. They are all excellent to eliminate uh, errors as well as uh, you know saving times. But uh, digital tools, what we put uh, input, what we feed in, uh, we get the result. So if our uh, input is wrong, everything else can uh, go haywire on board ships. Apart from these storage uh, categories of uh, on deck or under deck. Uh, there is uh, there are storage and handling codes assigned in uh, column 16A of dangerous goods list. Uh, storage codes are with SW and handling codes are H for hotel. Uh, these handling codes will bring in additional conditions like protection from sources of heat, protection from sources of ignition, protection from direct sunlight, uh, mandatory requirement of reefer containers, etc. Like if you look at this uh, UN3111 on the screen, uh, SW1 and SW3. So SW3 is shall be transported under temperature control. So that mandatorily require a reefer container. 2901, bromine chloride, SW2, clear of living quarters. So the storage, even though it is, if it is loaded on deck, uh, on deck only because it is category D on deck only, it must be stored well away from the living quarters. So these type of additional informations are there in column 16A apart from storage category on deck or under deck where it can be stored or where it must not be stored on board ship. When we take uh, talk about clear of living quarters, uh, living quarters uh, who have not uh, been on board ship, uh, you can just uh, imagine that accommodation, that white building like structure where the officers and crew uh, resides. Uh, that is accommodation uh, and that accommodation plus any any places where the missionary spaces enclosed work areas air intakes for the ventilation of the accommodation air conditioners intakes from the at least three meters distance must be there for those containers which are having clear of living quarters as the storage code similarly certain dangerous goods require store away from combustible materials Combustible materials means anything which can catch fire, which can burn. Example like wood, paper, straw, vegetable, fibers, etc. Uh, this uh, segregation from combustible material also involves when we are packing uh, a container uh, with mixed loading the container. But in this case, combustible material does not involve packaging materials or any damage required for packing of the container or the packaging that is excluded from the definition of combustible material but other combustible materials must not be loaded together when the storage is requiring away from combustible materials similarly protection protection from sources of ignition uh, uh, sources of ignition includes any machinery exhaust like uh, engine room exhaust the ship's galley that is the kitchen of the ship uh, galley exhaust electrical outlets uh, refrigerated containers, heated cargo transport unit, that is heated tank containers, if it is not a certified uh, explosion proof type, they are all potential source of ignition. Source of ignition is any, anything which can, uh, you know, electrical uh, equipments or anything which is generating excessive heat, uh, which can start a fire. So there are segregation and storage requirement away from sources of ignition. Similarly, protection from sources of heat. When we talk about so sources of heat, on board ships, there are many places uh, where excessive heat will be generated. 
like uh, steam pipes, uh, the fuel tanks in the bottom of the ship, uh, which may be heated during the passage, and bulkheads of the engine room. Those places are, uh, you know, extremely hot. So the heat sensitive dangerous goods must not be stored next to that. There the requirement is at least a minimum 2.4 meters away from sources of heat. Uh, this is a depiction of uh, where the cargo will be or may be exposed to heat. Towards the bottom of the ship, there are fuel tanks uh, which may be heated during the passage for using the fuel to the engine uh, up to 90, 100 degrees uh, Celsius. So that may affect the cargo. Uh, also, which is sitting next to the engine room bulkhead may get affected to the uh, effect, uh, get affected by the heat of the cargo. Heat sensitive cargoes must not be loaded there. Similarly, there are certain dangerous goods where the containers must be protected from direct sunlight. They must not be loaded right on top, uh, which is exposed to the sun. Now, the question is which ships can carry dangerous goods or, or all, all ships are allowed to carry dangerous goods. It is not like that. Every ship is issued with a document of compliance under uh, SOLAS Convention Relation 2219. Uh, relation 2219 is for carriage of dangerous goods that requires the vessel, every vessel to have a specific document of, uh, of compliance which authorizes what class of dangerous goods is permitted to or authorized to be loaded in a particular cargo hold. Package dangerous goods as well as dangerous goods in bulk under International Maritime Solid Bulk Cargo Code. So that document will uh, specify which class uh, UN, which not UN number, which class can be loaded or not. In this document of compliance, class 6.2 and 7, that is infectious substances and radioactive materials are not included in the document of compliances, compliance. Similarly, dangerous goods in limited quantities and accepted quantities are not included in document of compliance. But a vessel operator may decide to apply the same rules which is applicable for dangerous goods not in limited quantities for dangerous goods in limited quantities while carrying or enhancing the safety. This is a layout of a uh, ship uh, from a document of compliance. Uh, on this you can see the cargo hold number one, cargo hold number two like that. There are cargo hold up to number six cargo hold, then engine room accommodation, then there is a cargo hold number seven behind the accommodation. Also on the top deck view, you can see weather deck number one and weather deck number two after the accommodation that is behind the ship. So document of compliance lists down which you, uh, class of uh, dangerous goods is permitted in a particular cargo hold or on the weather deck. Basis on that only we can accept to load a cargo on a particular ship in a particular cargo hold apart from IMDG codes online or on deck or under deck. Uh, regulations. This is the layout of document of compliance of a particular vessel. Here you can see all the classes are listed vertically and horizontally the cargo spaces are listed 1 to 7 and weather deck 1 and 2. Weather deck 1 is the forward of accommodation and weather deck uh, 2 is behind the accommodation uh, towards the aft which is exposed to the weather. Wherever this letter P is listed that classes are permitted to be loaded in that particular uh, cargo hold. I have highlighted uh, class 3 and class 6.1 and 8, also class 9 with red boxes. That is just for highlighting class 3 flammable liquid, the document of compliance authorization for loading in a particular cargo hold all depends upon the flash point. Like if you look at class 3 flash point below 23 degrees, it is permitted only in cargo hold number 1, 2 and 3. But if you look at class 3 flash point 23 to 60, it is allowed in cargo hold 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but not allowed in cargo hold number 7. So when we are when the shippers are making the dangerous goods declaration or the freight forwarders are passing on the dangerous goods declaration on behalf of the shipper to the carrier. If they make any mistake in the declaration of the flash point, it can result in the container being loaded in a non-authorized uh, cargo hold and it may have, uh, you know, it may result in accident or other fires and explosion under deck, uh, which the crew and the officers may not be able to uh, control. 
out at sea. Similarly, when you look at uh, class 9 in the uh, document of compliance, class 9 is uh, listed two times. Class 9 which uh, evolves fl uh, flammable vapor and those goods which does not evolve flammable vapor. So, uh, class 9 which is evolved, which can evolve flammable vapors are polymeric beads. Uh, so, they are having a different condition for loading under deck. Uh, this points out that uh, what we are declaring, we as shippers, freight forwarders, or whoever in the shore side making the load list, etc., if we make any mistake, it can trigger an error in the storage planning, which will result in a wrong box uh, going into a wrong place at the wrong moment, and it, it may result in accidents out at sea. Let's talk about segregation. That is all storage where we can keep on deck or under deck. We'll be coming back to the storage again after we look at the segregation. Segregation is one of the most important aspects of uh, dangerous goods transport. Whenever multiple cargoes are loaded inside the same cargo transport unit, same container, segregation rules are applicable. Also, different containers when we are loading on board ship, segregation rules may be applicable between those containers depending on the uh, what dangerous goods are packed within. Segregation uh, is uh, highlighted in part 7 of IMDG code. It is a process of separating two or more dangerous goods when they are mutually incompatible with each other. When we say mutually incompatible with each other, that means supposing if the package breaks, uh, there is a spillage or leakage, but the two, both the packages or one package, if that chemical come in contact with the other chemical, other dangerous goods, it may result in violent uh, uh, chemical reaction releasing heat, uh, toxic vapors, or it may result in explosion and fire. That is one of the example of uh, mutual incompatibility like acids and alkalis or uh, cyanides and acids or organic substances and uh, oxidizing, uh, powerful oxidizing liquids can also result in such things. Another mutual incompatibility is when two dangerous goods are packed together in the same container, they may not dangerously react with each other in case if they come in contact, but together when involved in fire, it may increase the fire hazard like uh, oxygen and uh, flammable liquid. If flammable liquid uh, catches fire and the same container is packed with uh, oxygen, then it will result in the fire, uh, you know, increasing the potential of the fire. There are four terms in uh, segregation rules in IMDG code. Uh, do not get confused or alarmed with all these terms. Uh, they are away from, separated from, separated by a complete compartment or hold from. When we say compartment or hold, that is a cargo hold. And again, separated longitudinally by an intervening cargo hold. These are the same terms which is applicable for dangerous goods if you are loading non-containerized on a general cargo vessel or containerized on container vessels or containerized on a uh, Roro vessel or containerized on a general cargo vessel or any conventional vessel in the conventional way of loading. The terms of the segregation 1, 2, 3, 4 remains the same. How it is applied for the different dangerous goods loaded in the same container may be different and different dangerous goods in different containers loading on a container ship and a uh, hatchless, con fully closed container ship and a hatchless container ship may be different. So that is what we are going to understand next. Before that, uh, this is a segregation table. Uh, it is uh, all the classes are listed down vertically and horizontally and the intersecting columns list down the same segregation rules number one to four away from separated from etc. And wherever there is uh, X, uh, the blue color, the user must refer to the dangerous goods list in the IMDG code to check whether any specific segregation rules are applicable or not. If there is not, if it is not applicable, then it may be loaded together in the same container. Now, when we talk about uh, segregation inside container, whenever there is a segregation rules applicable between the goods, they are not permitted inside the same container, except for away from which may be loaded if it is authorized by competent authority. All other segregation rules are not per permitted inside the container. As I said, uh, individual UN numbers may have additional segregation rules, like for example, UN 1814, potassium hydroxide, it must be separated from acids. It is an alkali. 
both acids and alkalis uh, fall under class 8. Uh, that is one of the most uh, mistakes uh, happen from the co-loaders or LCL operators. They are seeing both are the same class. They may load together uh, without realizing they require segregation. Similarly, uh, UN2211 polymeric bridge class 9, it must be segregated as for class 3. So even though it is class 9, for all the purpose of segregation, we must consider that as class 3 and it must be separated from class 1 explosives other than 1.4 S. So this is the importance of uh, looking at each individual entry of the UN number instead of just saying class 9 is acceptable on all chips and no segregation applicable etc. Uh, it is not like that. Uh, individual uh, entries must be looked at. When we talk about uh, segregation of onboard ships, uh, it can segregation rules can change depending on the type of equipment. Type of equipment, whether it is a closed container or an open container. Open container is flat track container or fabric container or open top container. So closed container to closed container, closed container to open container, open to open, vertical, four and a half, a third ship, all these things can change the segregation rules depending on what cargoes are carried uh, within the container. Similarly, as per the types of ships, container ships with closed cargo holds, hatchless container ships, row-row vessels, barge carrying ships, every ships are having different uh, segregation rules. Uh, somebody has said uh, I should go a little slow. I'm sorry. I will uh, try to maintain my speed a little slow. Uh, any slide, if you want to see back, uh, we will go back uh, towards the end. Uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, this is the layout of a ship. Uh, when we talk about a top ship, uh, that is the rows of containers from the center line of the ship towards the right and left hand side, that is starboard side and port side. Then the containers will be loaded vertically as well as uh, four and half, four and half, that is from the towards the front side and the behind side, aft side of the ship. So now uh, this, uh, when we talk about uh, loading on board ship, uh, some of the shippers uh, do ask uh, when their container is, uh, you know, accepted well in advance and it is gated in, uh, after that it is, you know, not included uh, on the, you know, it, it did not get loaded in the vessel sail. So the you know it can be a reason that the end end of the day uh, the storage planner could not uh, plan it correctly because of you know other dangerous goods loading as well as uh, time sensitive cargoes like uh, reefers excessive number of uh, reefers are the so this cargo was not compatible so it is left behind so those type of issues can happen uh, in the shipping industry. This is the chart of uh, segregation on board uh, container ships with closed cargo hold. You can see vertical, horizontal, fore and aft, and uh, all other, and etward ship. So the same segregation rules are applicable. That is number one away from number two, separated from number three, separated by a complete compartment or hold from etc. Again, the differences come whether it is closed container against a closed container, or a closed container against an open container, or open against an open container then this mix match will decide whether it can be loaded together or we should maintain a one container space or two container space or if it is under deck, whether it should be a different cargo hold or not. So this is very critical uh, for the uh, planning of the storage dangerous goods for enhancing safety of life out at sea because the vessel staff will not have much time to check whether everything is perfect before sailing out. So all they depend on is the accurate storage planning from the shore side and storage planners can plan it only with the information what is available with them and that information what is available with them is supplied by the shippers through multi, maybe through multiple parties like freight forwarders, booking officers, etc. where nobody should make any mistakes or add or subtract anything from those information which can result in uh, wrong storage planning. This is for the closed cargo hold uh, container ship and this is for the hatchless container ship. Hatchless container ship again, the vertical uh, segregation will not be achieved when it is a separation between the deck is required. Uh, I will uh, display a vessel uh, profile here. This is a hatchless container ship. Uh, if you look at the towards the forward part of the ship, there is a deck. So there it can be loaded on deck, under deck separation can be achieved. 
in the other areas of the hatchless container ship, the vertical segregation cannot be achieved. So on hatchless container ship, the segregation becoming becomes more uh, complicated or difficult when uh, vertical segregation is uh, required. These days, number of container ships with hatchless options are very less in the industry, but still. When we look at the segregation between containers, uh, this is the just a layout how it can be achieved uh, or non-combatable goods are those empty boxes. The black shaded ones are the containers carrying dangerous goods. So when the regulations say one container space, two container spaces and three container spaces, how it can be achieved on board ship uh, when we are doing the storage planning. So I have listed down three scenarios that is closed versus closed container closed uh, versus open container and open versus open container just to understand how it is uh, this is the segregation table says uh, separated from each other and closed versus closed here you can see longitudinally is the fore and aft uh, that is the length right of the ship a third ship is left and right hand side that is a port and starboard side of the ship and uh, top deck view and the view in the cargo hold so the black shaded box is the dangerous goods uh, container and wherever that box with the November letter N, those are the dangerous goods with the uh, non incompatible dangerous goods. They must not be loaded in those areas. So this is close versus close. You can see that four and a half, it is one container space. A thought ship again, one container space. Under that, it is one container space or one bulkhead. Vertical not in the same vertical line unless segregated by a deck so it can be one under deck and one on deck but again that under deck container must be permitted by imdg code with storage code a b or e on or under deck if it is storage code c or d it cannot be loaded under deck same thing separated from situation closed versus closed closed versus open and open versus open both are open top or you know flat track containers or fabric side containers so as the containers different types of containers are involved the segregation rule uh, become more mandatory uh, more stringent uh, this layout and the illustration of all these uh, container storage dangerous goods storage uh, requirement segregation requirement is published in the maritime safety committee circular number 1440 this was in IMDG code in the old days in part 7 uh, before 2012, I believe. From 2012 onwards, they removed that from the IMDG code and published in a separate circular. So anybody interested to learn more about this uh, you know, segregation of containers on different types of uh, vessels, they can uh, download this msc.1 slash circular 1440. Uh, look up in the internet, you, can, uh, you may get it for downloading that uh, lays that down. Segregation on Roro ships, uh, uh, some of the attendees are working in related with the uh, Roro industry. They had uh, particular questions on uh, Roro ship segregation and uh, storage planning. Uh, segregation on Roro ship is uh, different from the container vessels. It uh, depends upon the whether the containers are loaded in the permanent storage portions on the Roro ships or in a conventional cargo space or if there are more than one container loaded on the same vehicle. That depending on that, the segregation on the Roro ship will change. But again, the rules of segregation remains same. The basic rules, that is number one, two, three, four, that away from separated from separated by a complete compartment or hold from, or separated by a longitudinally by an intervening complete compartment or hold from. That rules are the universal basic rules. The rest everything may change depending on the type of vessel and uh, type of the equipment. This is the uh, segregation table for the containers on Roro vessels, on deck, under deck, etc. In the case of uh, Roro vessels, it is not the one container space or two container space. It is the distance is directly asked by three meters, six meters, 12 meters, 24 meters, 36 meters, etc. And separation of the deck. Here you can see uh, how the layout, the black shaded uh, vehicles are those carrying dangerous goods and the vehicles uh, with an X mark are the vehicles which is non-combatable dangerous goods must not be kept next to that. 
it is 3, 6, 12, 24 meters, 36, 48 meters, get that difference. Uh, some of the attendees have uh, posted uh, some questions uh, while registering for this event. Uh, some of the questions are addressed in these slides itself and certain questions which could not be addressed in this uh, presentation are addressed at the towards the end of this session specific to that questions. So if you hang on, you will get those questions. Again, this is the layout on the roller vessels. Here it is all uh, vehicles loaded on the different decks of the vessel. You can see main deck, tank top, queen deck number one, two, and weather deck, etc. Uh, one question was uh, how to, uh, the storage planning is done on the roller vessels uh, when the information of the cargo is almost received at the last end when the vehicle is driving inside. We will look at that later. Now let's go to the specific storage uh, requirement for different uh, classes of uh, uh, dangerous goods, not all of them, some of them. Explosives, the IMDG code says, uh, must not be stored closer to the ship side than a distance equal to one eighth of the beam or 2.4 meters, whichever is lesser. Uh, that is the rule of uh, loading uh, of explosives on board ship uh, as per IMDG code. Similarly, IMDG code says, uh, containers carrying class one explosives must not be stored to a distance lesser than 12 meters from living quarters and life-saving appliances Life-saving appliances are those lifeboats and uh, all other uh, rescue craft, etc., which is uh, as per the unified interpretation of Maritime Safety Committee, these life-saving appliances are those which are the main life-saving uh, survival craft of the vessel, not those life jackets and uh, life poise what we keep uh, you know, next to the pilot ladder or something. That is not included in this. Also, the class 1 explosives must be loaded uh, clear of uh, public access places. Public access places are also uh, unifiedly explained by IMO. On cargo ship, the uh, public access is embarkation, dis disembarkation area of the pilot boarding. Also, where the, normally the crew walk up and down the catwalks, uh, the paint lockers, etc., etc. On the passenger ship, again, embarkation point and all other public access areas as defined by the cargo ship. So explosives, there is a separate uh, say, uh, storage rule for getting it cleared from the uh, crew and passengers access areas. Ventilation for the cargo hold. IMDG code says these classes, that is flammable gases of 2.1, flammable liquids less than 23 degree flash point. Here again, the declaration, shipper's declaration's uh, accuracy comes in point. The flash point, uh, supposing if the flash point is minus 24, it is obviously less than 23. But if we forget to mention that hyphen mark, then minus 24 will become plus 24. Then it may be loaded, loaded in a wrong cargo hold. So uh, th that is the importance of the shipper's declaration, accuracy of the shipper's declaration. So all these dangerous goods classes require, if it is permitted under deck, then IMDG code requires the under deck cargo space to have a mechanical ventilation. How much must be affecting the ventilation? How many number of air changes for that ventilation? That depends upon the satisfaction of the flag state of the vessel. Class 2 flammable, 2.1 flammable gases and two point, uh, class 3 flammable liquids having a flash point below 23 degrees must be stored at least 2.4 meters away from potential sources of ignition. So if you are having a uh, flammable liquid container having flash point lesser than 23 degrees, it cannot be loaded next to a live reefer because reefer is a source of ignition. Similarly, if any live reefer is loaded under deck, the same under deck place cannot load any container with uh, flammable liquid having flash point below 23 degrees unless that reefer container is a explosion proof uh, electrical equipment or electrical fittings are ex explosion proof according to International Electrotechnical Committee's uh, standard. So when reefers are loaded under deck, same under deck space cannot load flammable liquid containers with less than 23 degree flash point. Special storage. All reefers which require regular temperature monitoring, uh, that is, uh, you know, especially the temperature controlled uh, dangerous goods cargo, which is having emergency temperature and control control and emergency temperature for safety reasons. 
for those dangerous goods it is stowage on deck only as per IMDG code it must be loaded on deck in the accessible place either on the hatch cover or on the deck stowage position 80 or 82 where the ship staff can go and check the temperature every four to six hours same way helium tanks refrigerated helium tanks the ship staff is supposed to take uh, two readings uh, every 12 hours and send it to the shipper including the latitude, longitude, weather, ETA, ETD, all those things and uh, liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, uh, pressure of uh, helium and pressure of nitrogen to the shipper. So for accessing that reading, it must be stored on deck only in the accessible area. Hazardous charcoal. Uh, charcoal is a hot topic. Charcoal is a hot thing as well as it is a hot topic. Uh, because many charcoals which is offered as non hazardous under the special portion of IMDG code has ended up uh, burning on board ships as well as in the storage yards. The hazardous charcoal IMDG code says category A on or under deck protected from sources of heat and keep as uh, cool as reasonably practical. But many of the ship operators uh, who are accepting hazardous charcoal they load it only on deck, uh, on deck these containers because there is a potential of starting the fire. Now comes the question of non hazardous charcoal. There are many containers going uh, with uh, cargoes declared as uh, non hazardous charcoal. Uh, there are certain provisions in IMTG code for uh, declaring charcoal as non hazardous according to that, whatever it is. Non hazardous charcoal, it is not regulated by IMDG code, so it will not come in the dangerous goods manifest. But the vessel operators must take care to you know include in some sort of list. And preferred storage for that is uh, on deck in an accessible area uh, in case if they require any temperature monitoring or you know whatever happens. Lithium batteries. Uh, uh, one other question I got uh, in advance was uh, lithium battery vehicles. Lithium batteries, it is on deck only, uh, on deck or under deck. But in case if the uh, lithium batteries are transported uh, as defective, damaged, or for disposal, then it is category C on deck only. But even if it is a fresh, brand new lithium battery on or under deck, there are some uh, vessel operators who load the lithium batteries on deck only because uh, there are uh, chances that lithium batteries may. Uh, experience a thermal runaway and result in fire. As we said, uh, the storage and segregation of dangerous goods on board ships uh, depends upon the uh, stringent rules of IMDG code and SOLAS convention. SOLAS IMDG code is actually nothing but the amplification of SOLAS uh, chapter 7 part A and Marpol NX3 for marine pollutants. It got storage categories, storage codes, handling codes and segregation. And uh, depending on the type of vessel, whichever vessel we are planning to load or offering the cargo, the vessel's document of compliance will say which class of dangerous goods is permitted in uh, which cargo hold or on uh, which weather deck. Vessel owners and operators uh, can introduce stricter in-house policies for dangerous goods storage and segregation on board ship above IMDG code, they cannot undermine the IMDG code requirement, but they can increase the uh, uh, you know, restriction or rules for their own safety. Uh, recently, after the 2018 MERS Honam fire, all of you must be very well aware about that news uh, where five seafarers lost their lives and one of the biggest uh, uh, loss in the maritime accident. Uh, these parties, uh, mainly classification societies, some of the vessel operators, uh, some of the vessel operators, uh, Exis Technologies and uh, TT Club, uh, in, uh, Marine Mutual Insurers, they all joined together and they published a safety consideration for vessel operators related to risk based storage of dangerous goods on board container ships. Now, this is a joint publication. If anybody would like to get access to this, they can visit on the left hand side of the screen. You can see the web address uh, cinsnet.com. You can uh, visit that website and may request them to give you access to that document. Now, some brief about this document. Some of you are uh, punching in something on the chat. I'm sorry if I'm not address that. I will look at that and I will address. 
lithium batteries uh, i am digital code 4020 i will uh, come on that uh, after this uh, presentation okay now this uh, i am digital code uh, when when i am digital code stipulates certain storage criteria like on deck only or on or under deck clear of living quarters that is the minimum safety as required by solas convention we cannot violate that now, when we look at this risk-based storage of dangerous goods on container ship published by uh, this joint, jointly published by these parties, they have certain restriction uh, recommendations for the vessel operators, which says that declared dangerous goods and high-risk cargoes should never be stored or should not be stored adjacent to accommodation, adjacent to engine room, above engine room, bottom tiers in the hold, because bottom tiers in the hold can get exposed to the heated fuel tank of the ships. Uh, rows under deck adjacent to the wing fuel tanks, outermost rows on the deck, forwardmost and aftmost base on the deck, and deck without being protected from direct sunlight or the work, work, uh, working spaces and walkways. Because these are the areas which can, which when the container is loaded and if something goes wrong, it can, you know, increase the hazard on board ship, especially close to the accommodation, close to the engine room directly on top of the fuel tank or on top of the walkways, etc. Uh, when we look at the MERS Hornham's accident, in, accident in, investigation report, there was no misdeclaration, nothing. It was a correctly classified cargo which uh, resulted in a thermal runaway and explosion, uh, which may trigger to uh, changes to certain special portions of IMDG code, because we all know that IMDG code is now 50, 60 years old and many things have been uh, revised. And uh, some of the revisions, uh, we, some of the things we can envisage only when some accident happens. Uh, then we learn from the accident and uh, we pull up our socks and increase the uh, regulatory requirements. This joint publication, they have assigned risk zone, risk zone uh, 0 to 5. That is 0 is for general cargo, then risk zone 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Uh, so this is a very good uh, uh, planning, a uh, very good way of uh, enhancing safety above the requirement of IMDG code. The, the main thing is for the protection of the life of sea, life at sea, protection of the vessel and firefighting ability, all those things above the requirement of IMDG code. Uh, the, in the last 15 years or so, last uh, one, one and a half decade, the size of the vessel has dramatically increased like in the uh, 2006 7 uh, the biggest ships were say 7 to 8000 9000 tu but today we have vessels with more than 20000 tu but the ability to fight fire and the number of the crew on board ship almost remains same uh, so the larger the vessel size the more dangerous it is when a container starts burning be it dangerous goods or non dangerous goods so this publication lays down the basics of the risk based storage uh, policy it's a recommendation for vessel operators, a very good document. I request all of you to go on uh, cinsnet.com and uh, see the information. Talking about that MERS Hornham uh, issue, after that MERS Hornham issue, National Cargo Bureau published a white paper, which is a comprehensive holistic approach to enhance safety and address the carriage of undeclared, misdeclared and other non-compliant dangerous goods. This white paper is 17, 18 pages long and it's a very good read for all of us uh, who are involved in transportation of dangerous goods because many of us who are having, uh, who are working on board uh, on uh, dangerous goods, we just open the IMDG code, comply with that, close the IMDG code, the cargo is loaded. If not loaded, we call up the other parties and start screaming and shouting. That is a way of working. But when we read this document, we learn to understand how complicated these dangerous goods uh, regulations can be, who all are the multiple uh, parties involved in uh, getting these cargoes safely transported from one place to another, and who all can get affected in case if something goes wrong with that cargo, and how each and every party must be uh, working jointly or collaborating for enhancing safety. In this white paper, I have highlighted certain things in this presentation. It says no dangerous goods should be accepted after established cutoff times without express approval from dangerous goods department. That is for respecting the cutoff time, maintain the cutoff time, after cutoff time, never push through a dangerous goods container. It may go into a wrong storage position on board ship 
also who are trying to push through that container may possibly overlook certain provisions from IMTG code. So the container may not be complying with the provisions of the code. In the National Power Bureau's uh, white paper, some of the points uh, which I have just uh, highlighted here is establish a dangerous good de goods department, a compliant DG training programs, disciplined cutoff time, DG documentation process, and DG planning process. Apart from that, risk based storage of dangerous goods, which we just uh, talked uh, previously. Then all other procedures like gating check, container inspection program, vessel inspection, common database, etc., etc. So here comes the importance of all the different departments who are involved in getting the dangerous goods safety from place A to place B. Which other departments are, which all departments are involved? What is their importance? Whether they should have training or not having training? What access they should have, etc. Now in this. They also say a 4i check should be developed to confirm proper storage and segregation. 4i check is uh, apart from the person who is authorizing the loading, another person should cross verify whether it is uh, correct or not. Uh, because you know when one person misses out something, the other person may uh, you know may not overlook that and it can be corrected. It says planners should only plan and load shipments included on a load list approved by the dangerous goods department. Now, some of the carriers, dangerous goods department only approve the cargo and another department is there called load list or cargo list department. They pull out the load list and give it to the planner. Uh, you know, some, some dangerous goods, uh, some carriers, dangerous goods department themselves will pull the load list and supply to the carrier, the storage planner. As well, any changes to the load list must be approved by the dangerous goods department, then only must be accepted by the planner. It further says a properly trained planner's knowledge to ensure all storage and segregation requirements are accounted for in accordance with the national regulations and the vessel's document of compliance. So here the uh, most of the things are done by the softwares these days, but apart from the sto softwares, the storage planner, dangerous goods uh, approvers in the or the validation team in the dangerous goods department, the booking team, uh, the gating check team, everybody, everybody must be having uh, their job function knowledge in IMDG code and other national regulations and port regulations to achieve the compliance of all the uh, required regulations, not only for the safety, including for the economical reasons, otherwise the vessel may be arrested in some ports if the cargo is prohibited in that port. Just highlighting a 4i check should be developed for confirming the proper storage and segregation. This is in nutshell information flow. Uh, not uh, I have not listed down all the information flows by step by step. The shipper's initial booking request on which the dangerous source department start uh, working on the acceptance of the cargo. Then it is shipper's declaration, dangerous source declaration. Then load list and manifest basis on that. Uh, the storage uh, basis on the load list. The storage panel plans the vessel, make the pay plan. So all the information originates from the shippers initial booking request and the dangerous goods declaration. So whatever mistakes happens or omission happens in the shippers declaration that can get amplified on the way and uh, result in a wrong storage or segregation on board ship or within the container which can result in uh, loss of lives or accidents uh, at sea. Now to achieve all these things for the compliance of the regulations or the IMDG code, SOLAS, or if you are uh, transporting cargo to and from United States, Code of Federal Aviation Title 49 will come into that. So for all these things, IMDG code says, every shoreside personnel who is involved in transportation of dangerous goods must receive training according to the job function he or she carries out. Now in this, again, I have highlighted uh, only two, three points uh, related to this topic, what we are talking today. Uh, those who are offering dangerous goods for transport, that is, you know, freight forwarders, shippers who offer to the carriers, those who are accepting dangerous goods for transport, that is a dangerous goods department of the carriers, and those who prepare dangerous goods loading storage plans, that is the storage planners, they must be re receiving training according to their job function. That must be initial training and refresher training whenever 
IMDG code changes every two years, new IMDG code changes, or any other uh, you know business practice changes of that company. Supposing this risk-based storage uh, planning, which is uh, introduced by uh, cargo incident notification system, that is above IMDG code. So if a storage planner is uh, company is adopting that storage uh, planning, uh, then the storage planners must be basically trained about that how to adopt that thing. So any change of practice also requires refresher training or retraining. I'll just quickly go through some of the questions which could not be addressed in the other slides. Uh, then I will throw it open for others questions. Uh, and before that, I'll be introducing some electronic uh, digital solutions of IMDG code. First, let us look at this questions uh, received. Uh, one question is that how many number of different dangerous goods can be packed in the same container? There are no limits of number of packages in a container as long as the segregation rules are maintained. If the segregation rules are not applicable, any number of boxes or jerry cans or tiny packages can be placed inside a say 40 foot high cube container. But when it comes to dangerous goods in accepted quantities, maximum number of packages of dangerous goods in accepted quantities per CTU per container cannot be more than 1000. This is a question which I cannot answer correctly. Like, what are the practical ways ship's crew could check, say, 600 dangerous goods loaded in a short port stay of 12 hours? In 12 hours, there are many dangerous goods containers, non dangerous, empty containers, reefers, flat tracks, everything is being loaded and discharged. And together with that, 600 dangerous goods are loaded. How the ship's officers and crew, are, crew can, you know, actually check these things? It is very difficult uh, process, it is because. Uh, not only the cargo operation, the ship staff will be engaged in the uh, checking of the mooring, the second mate will be busy for the passage planning, all those type of things, in, uh, including the shoreside visitors and officials. That is where the importance of the accuracy of the shipper's declaration, dangerous goods approval, desk and storage planners function comes in. If we do, if the shoreside people do not do any mistake, then it is, uh, you know, lesser stress on the ship staff. Ship staff, the mate uh, and second mate do cross check the storage plan to check whether any container is going in the wrong storage position like on deck only is loading under deck or any segregation violation. But actually in the practical scenario, they do not get that much of, that much of time. We have another question, what happens in case if it is loaded in a wrong position? Before that, uh, one question I got, uh, somebody posted was on Roro ship where loading lists are received almost at the time of loading. Are there improvements in the industry to promote an online system where there is real-time information to the crew and terminal? Uh, when you have the Roro vessels, the exact number of vehicles uh, being loaded and if they are containing the dangerous goods or not, that comes at the last moment. So is there any real-time IT system, etc.? I'm not very sure what is the latest IT systems used by these uh, vehicle carriers and the ferries. Uh, for maintaining the cargo. I'm sorry for that. I'm, I'm not uh, having that information. Maybe I will try to get that information published later on my website. But let us look at what IMDG code says about Roro ships and the duties of the master. IMDG code says the master of a ship, that is a Roro ship, carrying dangerous goods in Roro cargo, cargo spaces, must ensure that during loading, unloading, and during the voyage, Regular inspections are made by an authorized school crew member or responsible person in order to achieve early detection of any hazard. So not only while loading and discharging, even during the passage, master must authorize a responsible officer or crew or anybody uh, who are on the crew list to ensure that person will do a regular inspection, monitoring of the cargo spaces, that nothing is going wrong or any, anything can go wrong so to prevent such mishap. So that provision is there in IMDG code. Maybe IMDG code made this uh, provision envisaging this last moment loading process of the load row ship. I'm not very sure. I'll try to get the correct answer later. Another question uh, asked by a ship's officer. Uh, this same question was asked uh, before also. Uh, so I could uh, get that answer from the website itself. Uh, this is a question like in case of the ship's officer, when the cargo operation is going on alongside, if he or she notices a container is loaded in a wrong position, what action the ship officer must take? Must take? 
Now, when we say loader in a wrong position, it can be on deck only loaded under deck. Uh, when segregation is required from heat or sources of heat and ignition, it is loaded next to that. When segregation is required from living quarters, it is loaded next to living quarters. Or, you know, when must be shaded from direct sunlight, again, the container is loaded directly on top tier. And uh, when dangerous goods, two containers requiring segregation, and when the gantry loads both of them together next to each other or one on top of each other, these are the uh, instances where wrong storage can happen. Now, what action can be taken by a ship's officer? If the violation is observed during the cargo operation, it must be immediately corrected by restoring the involved box. If the violation supposing is observed after departure uh, from that load port, then it can be corrected upon arrival of the next uh, port. But again, if the risk is more uh, for that particular uh, two boxes wrongly stored next to each other or stored next to a heated source, etc., a wrong storage, then it may require the vessel to recall to the original load port and correct the storage or go to the nearest port and get it corrected because actually once you load in a wrong storage position like on deck only container you load it under deck then actually you are out of the minimum safety requirement of the solas convention then you are uh, you know uh, sailing again with that kind of condition condition may enhance the probability of running into something wrong uh, including loss of lives and loss of uh, uh, vessel and cargo. Also, the vessel of uh, vessel staff, the ship staff must issue a note of protest. Uh, then inform the load terminal, charter, PNI clubs, vessel owners, whoever involved to inform them. Another question I received was: uh, Can hazardous segregation rule for vessel can be considered for yard operation? Now, when we talk about segregation rule inside container, there is a different segregation rule. Uh, wherein it says that whenever segregation rules are applicable, it cannot, those cargoes must not be loaded in the same container except for away from with a competent authority approval. And container to container segregation on container vessels, Roro vessels, hatchless container vessels, general cargo vessels are different. So, what happens in the yard, in the ports, terminals, yards, container freight stations, etc.? What segregation rules must be considered? We can consider the same segregation rules which is required for IMDG code. But it is more stringent rule. So if we try to implement the same IMDG code segregation rule to the yard operation, it may not be that economically wise uh, for optimum utilization of the uh, you know facility. So in this case, I would recommend uh, to use the IMO's recommendation for uh, safe transport of dangerous cargoes and related activities in port areas. That is a publication available on IMO. It can be downloaded. That publication, it is quite big public, uh, book. It is. It contains dangerous goods in uh, uh, bulk carriers, bulk oil tankers, all those things, including packaged dangerous goods. When we talk about this containerized and non-containerized cargo, it talks about packages, IBCs, trailers, flat tracks, rail wagons, open dock containers, closed containers, including whether inside the warehouse or in the open areas. So, whoever asked this question, and for everybody's sake, I have displayed that segregation table here. This is the segregation table for port areas. If you look at this segregation table, you will see that uh, there is no uh, class 1 explosives, there, are, there is no class 7 radioactive or class 6.2 infectious substances because IMO recommends those cargoes must be whenever possible handled direct loading or direct discharge, that is direct delivery only. And this segregation table is quite simpler than that. It talks about whether segregation is required in open area, longitudinally, laterally, inside closed warehouses and sheds. Apart from this segregation table, again similar like the other segregation table, the user must also check the specific segregation requirement of that particular UN number, whether anything else is required or not. Emergency response. Is there any specific cleaning management plan for various kinds of dangerous goods and chemicals? Uh, uh, when we talk about this uh, dangerous goods village and uh, fire response, each and every dangerous goods may have different natures. Some of them are water reactive, some may, spontaneous, may be spontaneously combustible, oxidizing. Some of the uh, class 4.2 uh, pyrophoric substances, the spillage may lead to fire. So there is no spillage control for pyrophoric substances. 
uh, because the village will immediately uh, require initiating the fire response. So the best way is that uh, refer the safety data sheets, uh, spillage and fire control, and uh, the relevant safety fire safety manual of that facility. Also, uh, U.S. Uh, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration (PHMSA) they publish an emergency response guidebook (ERG), which is very useful for such situations for land-based, that is, shore-based emergency response on uh, spillage and uh, firefighting. This can be downloaded from their uh, website, that is, phmsa.org, uh, as PDF book, desktop application, or mobile application for your Android phone or iPhone. As we have seen this uh, image uh, before, uh, various accidents happen. Most of these accidents are resulting from non-compliant uh, dangerous goods or undeclared dangerous goods, or it may be everything is compliant, but uh, something else, you know, uh, can go wrong. Like uh, if a container is correctly, uh, cargo is correctly classified, correctly packed in the dangerous goods are packaged uh, correctly in IBCs or drums, the placards or the remarks or the dangerous goods declaration is 100% perfect. Still, it can go wrong if the securing of cargo inside the container is not proper. The stack may collapse, allowing the cargo to escape from the packages, resulting in fire, dangerous reaction or explosion. So, therein comes the importance of CTU code. CTU code is Cargo Transport Unit Code, published in 2014, which is not mandatory. But CTU port addresses the correct uh, method of packing and unpacking of containers, containers as well as other cargo transport units like uh, uh, road vehicles and rail wagons, etc. Uh, but most of us are into the box containers trade, so that's why I keep uh, repeating the container. So CTU port is very important. It is not that dangerous goods are correctly packed, but if, we, uh, if the securing inside the boxes are not correct, it can still result in uh, mishaps out at sea or uh, en route. Our next webinar is on uh, December 18th uh, at same time, 3.30 afternoon India time, 1000 uh, UTC about uh, importance of CTU code and how it can be implemented for car by cargo packers. Uh, as the saying goes by George uh, Santayana, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. So we must not repeat the mistakes committed by others uh, knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, then only we can avoid uh, these type of mishaps out at sea. There are further references uh, which are available on uh, my website. My website is shashikarana.com. Uh, I have listed down here, you can see on the screen, IMDG code online, e-learning, etc. While talking about this IMDG code training, uh, you see, training is one of the first step. It is very, very mandatory. But after training, uh, we must have the access to IMDG code. If there is no access to IMDG code, either printed book or software, there is no use of training because IMDG code is not for uh, by hearting. It is for you know referring and applying. So uh, training is very, very mandatory as well as uh, the access to the IMDG code. While talking about this, uh, we have on board with us uh, Mr. Chris Barker from Axis Technologies uh, from UK. Uh, I would invite, uh, like to invite uh, Chris to talk something about what solutions uh, Axis Technologies provide for shippers, freight forwarders, and vessel operators uh, on soft, you know, e-learnings and other digital platform. Uh, Chris, can you hear me and uh, reply? I can hear you, Sashi. Yeah, hi Chris, uh, yes, you are audible. Thanks, uh, thanks Thanks for the introduction. Um, what I just wanted to say uh, briefly, uh, thanks Sashi for that session. Uh, there's a number of interesting things that I think he brought up uh, there. Um, firstly, um, the, the, the role that everybody has to play in making sure that the carriage of uh, dangerous goods is safe. Uh, this isn't just the responsibility of the guys on the ships or even the shipping lines or anything like that. It, it starts with uh, the shipper. It starts then moves on to the warehouse, the transport company, the port receiving the goods, um, the, the, the port handling the goods and the, and the ship, uh, and then right through to delivery. So everybody should really have a very good knowledge of uh, dangerous goods regulations. 
and the safe carriage of dangerous goods that they're involved in. Now, I think um, in Sashi's session, we can see how detailed and how much information that there is. Uh, and kind of what we try and do as Exis Technologies is, is we, we try and help people as much as we possibly can um, as part of our mission of safety of life and cargo at sea to uh, to understand the regulations, uh, to receive a suitable training, but also to have uh, suitable tools to help them uh, to, to be able to uh, maintain the regulations uh, with, the, with, the, with the IMDG code. So um, for, for, from our part, um, I'm happy to, to talk to you here. Um, I would like to invite everybody uh, to uh, take a look at, at Exis Technology and, and we have links through Sashi's website uh, to see what we do and see how we might be able to, to help you uh, with training. Uh, for example, we have a complete e-learning uh, training program, uh, which is based on the IMDG code, also CTU code training, uh, IT core uh, tank uh, tr training. We have specific uh, training for that. Um, our IMDG code learning, it, it relates to all function specific roles. Uh, so it's, it's fully compliant with the IMDG code. We have a, a complete range of dangerous goods experts who work for Exis Technologies in the UK. So we're constantly uh, updating the regulations to the latest versions. Uh, we consider the IMDG code, ADR regulations, 49 CFR, um, rail, uh, and other local regulations around the world. So we can consider multimodal journeys as well, for example. And I think, um, you know, once guys have training and we try to make that training as accessible to everybody as possible, um, we don't want uh, price to be a factor in ignorance. You know, I think everybody who can be trained should be trained. Uh, so please, let's not make cost an excuse for somebody losing their life, uh, because ultimately that's what happened on the Merce Conam, for example. Um, you know, no sailor should lose his life because somebody's trying to save a few uh, pounds or dollars or whatever it, the currency is. Um, you know, that that shouldn't happen. Um, so we try to make the training as accessible as possible. And also, what we do is is we supply a range of tools which help um, people to comply. So, Sashi mentioned a number of complex issues there relating to stowage and segregation and, and of mixed hazardous loads. And, and what we do is, is we supply a, a range of tools which help people to understand quite quickly what can go together and what cannot go together and what should be separated and segregated from ad adhering to, to all of the rules. Um, our uh, tool is, is is fully compliant with the IMDG code and other codes such as ADR. Um, so we, um, we 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 invite people to use that tool uh, to understand uh, which loads can go together and which loads can't. And we have a a, a program with Sashi, who's who's kindly helped us with this uh, via his website to offer free trials uh, to a product called Hascheck Online. Um, so this is, again, cost shouldn't be an issue. Take a look at the software, uh, see whether you think it might be useful in your in your job, in your roles. Uh, Sashi can take your details, can get in touch with me and we'll arrange a, a trial for you to take a look at the software free of cost. Uh, and you can have a look at that at your leisure and see whether you think that that would be something that would be useful to you. Um, some of those tools, uh, are designed to work on board vessels and include uh, the ability to produce a dangerous goods manifest, for example. Um, they uh, understand storage and segregation on board a vessel, so it's not just within a CTU. Um, but the, the Hascheck Online solution that we have is, is, uh, is mainly a tool for people who are uh, wanting to inquire about the dangerous goods list uh, and also to it gives them the possibility to produce a dangerous uh, goods note, uh, uh, an actual note which can be used to safely transport cargo. And the way that our solution works there 
is, is that the user is only able to complete a dangerous goods note when the load is compliant. Um, and lastly, just to just to finish off there, what I would say is, is that we work with nine out of the top 10 shipping lines in the world. Um, we work with um, 18 out of the top 20. We supply our training to six out of the top 10 shipping lines in the world. We work with many row row companies around the world and we have our courses, our e-learning courses and our tools approved for, uh, for use by a number of competent authorities. Um, so please as users feel confident to, to come to us um, and, uh, and use our products. Uh, Sashi mentioned uh, SINs, cargo incident notification um, solution. We, um, we are board members of SINs. We uh, produce the risk zone data for that free of charge. Uh, we have a number of free solutions to help compliance. So I'd encourage everybody on the call just to engage with us and we'd be happy to, to help where we can. Uh, and lastly, just thanks to Sashi for the opportunity to come on and talk to you and I hope it's useful. Um, you know, please feel free to contact me after this and I'll be happy to uh, to engage with anybody. Thank you.